For those of you who aren't familiar with the Army Archives, one of the things that we have in the Armor Collection are the archives that were used by Richard Pierce Honeycutt when he wrote the famous series of books on American armor. Uh, Sherman, Firepower, Stuart, uh, 10 books in total. In fact, I can't see them because they're actually behind my chair uh, on my bookshelves here. Um, and so uh, one of the things me and Sophie were talking about if you were just coming in is when this uh, current uh, environment began kicking off um, and uh, pandemic uh, measurements were put in place, of course, Army Museum System was looking at ways we could work at home, and so they were asking us to come up with ideas. Uh, one of the things I decided to do was to go ahead and start uh, digitizing some of our archives. Uh, a lot of it's used for research, uh, both by historians and the Army today. And so I brought home with me some of the RP Honeycutt archives to do that. And so uh, over the last couple of weeks, I've been looking at how could I share that with the uh, viewers like you and the public. Uh, sound like a PBS commercial there almost. Um, <laughs> But how could I share that with other people? Because it's a really great archive. A lot of people love the books, of course, probably the best series on American tanks ever made. Uh, and so that's why I'm here now. I have a selection from the Firepower archives. Uh, a couple notes. Of course, the only reason why I have these home is because of the current environment. Uh, these were all signed out. I actually bring the boxes they're in. They're signed out, recorded what I have. Um, I'm not trying to hoard these for my own personal use or anything. Um, taking care of them, and then they will go back after they're digitized. Uh, Second thing is you'll notice, even though I'm not wearing any gloves, uh, my hands have been freshly washed. Actually, when you work with paper goods uh, in our industry, you actually aren't supposed to wear gloves because gloves can actually tear the paper fibers and they actually make it harder to turn the page without ripping it. Uh, and then uh, finally, any statements I make tonight while we're discussing these archives, personally, they're just my own statements. They don't represent the views of the US Army, Department of Defense, the Center of Military History. Um, that banter is all my own. Um, and I just want to leave it at that. Uh, I don't know if I'm missing anything else, Sophie. Is there anything else I should, should add? I think that that's solid. It reflects what you've uh, said in our previous introductions sure. to your videos online. So I'd like to welcome oh. everybody again. And I'm proud to bring Rob Kogan to stream. Without further ado, let us get into... I have here in my hands, I mentioned that I brought some of the Firepower archives home to my library so I could uh, scan. And unfortunately, I'm being hounded right now by one of my hounds. Uh, it's okay, buddy. You'll be fed a little bit. Um, <laughs> His name is Patton, by the way. Take dog. <laughs> oh, now he, he's, he went and he plopped over right beside the camera. Uh, but one of the things I have brought is this is the technical notes on the T-29 heavy tank, which everyone loves and adores. Let me, there we go. So if you were RP Honeycutt, after years of research, this is one of the notebooks you would make. Um, and just to tell you how much research R.P. Honeycutt did. So we all know his 10 basic books, Sherman, Stewart, Firepower, Abrams, Patton, all those. There's 10 of them. Uh, Sherman alone, his notebooks, at least that I've been able to, to inventory, and I still have boxes to go through. I have counted so far over 40 of these books that he used to make the Sherman book. So you're seeing that much of his research going into it. Now, he, he's giving you pretty much the most important stuff because he's not including all the dry memorandums on, on mundane things. Um, but some of the stuff actually provides good insight. So this is his notebook that he used for research uh, firepower. Um, what it is, this particular volume, making sure you all can see as much as you can. So this is the notes on material. So heavy tank T29, T standing for test. Because uh, it was never put into main production. If it would have been, it would have probably become the M29 heavy tank. Uh, so this is as close as you're going to get to the field manual. Or the operator's manual, if you will. You know, you would keep in your glove box. Um, yes, I know you're hungry. And this pretty much tells you how to take care of and operate the vehicle. And do not worry, my wife will feed the doggy. The doggy will be fed. Don't, don't, don't fall into his, his pleading. He does that. So T-29 as a heavy tank. All right, equipped with the 105 millimeter gun. So of course, nothing would be complete without table of uh, contents. All right, scope. So these notes on material are published to provide all concern with the development, excuse me, sir, development type ordnance material described within. What it's saying is it describes the vehicle and actually tells you everything about it. Uh, so it gives us a general, excuse me, come here. Come here, come here. All right, so 
T-29 is a heavily armored full track lane combat vehicle powered by a power pack. And you notice power pack in parentheses consisting of a Ford V-12. So what does it mean by a power pack, if you will? That sounds really cool. It's a lot more mundane than you think. Uh, power pack means that the engine and transmission are combined and connected into one unit, which makes maintenance a lot easier. If you're, if you're familiar with how the uh, Sherman tank was designed in World War II, you have the engine in the back, transmission in the front, there's a drivetrain in between. With a power pack system, everything is combined, so you replace all of it at once when you're doing field maintenance. Uh, moving on down, it talks about how it has a cross-drive coolant supply and cooling systems mounted and connected as to provide ready, uh, readily removable assembly. So everything, including your, your cooling systems, is all connected to try to make field maintenance easy, uh, which today, that sounds like a no-brainer, kind of going back to the whole hindsight's 2020, but in World War II, that was a very new concept. All right, the vehicle carries a 105 millimeter gun mounted in a fully closed power operated turret, which can traverse 360 degrees. This is what I find funny. Has a very low silhouette. The T-29 has a very low silhouette, apparently. Oh, oh, that's new to me. That's that's new. Yeah, that's I've never seen that phrase and the T-29 used ever. Um, I'd argue that it's one of the tanks that we've made that has like the highest silhouette. <laughs> that and its it looks like a battleship sitting there. <laughs> it's just incredibly huge. Yeah, oh, it is. but I mean, yeah, the um, whole thing all together. It's a, uh, it's interesting. Anyways, I'm sorry. Oh. Continue. That's, that's oh no, no, you're fine. Cause, so I should point out to people a lot of this stuff I've never gone to see before myself. I've maybe cracked open them, looked into them a little bit. I've never gone to sit and read through these. So some of this stuff. I'm going to be seeing it for the first time as well. So if it seems like I'm kind of taking my time or I seem a little surprised, that's why. Do not worry. We're all having fun together. Uh, it talks about how the turret is mounted well for the center of the vehicle. A bulge at the rear of the turret, rounded turret, acts as a counterweight for the 105 millimeter gun. So what it's saying is the design of the T-29 turret is specifically because the gun is so heavy, it has to have enough weight in the turret so the gun, the turret will actually spin smoothly on the vehicle because if not part of the vehicle will grind as it turns and you're gonna have a bad time hmm. so you have one caliber 30 machine gun mounted on the co-driver side 250 caliber machine guns coaxially mounted on the left side of the gun and then you have a 50 caliber anti-aircraft machine gun mounted on top of the turret so you got much much firepower plenty of daca as war war hammer players would say um hall is a well welded structure of heavy armor plate sides with cast armor steel front and turret sections welded to the hull. And then we go into tabulated data. So this tells us, this tells us all the, the very fine specifics of the vehicle. Uh, and this would actually be only imp really important, not just for you know how big is my vehicle, but when we're talking about can it be on a rail car, can it possibly fit in an airplane, this is the important stuff. So hull length is 288 inches, uh, but overall length with the gun forward is 426 inches. So that just tells you kind of how long the gun is. Uh, overall height is 122 inches. So we're talking a little over 10 feet tall, which seems short, but I guess when you know, consider average human height, that does sound sound right for it. Um, seems profile, a lot better. Very low profile. Yeah, so low, extremely tank. low. Lowest profile ever. <laughs> S tank profile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, hall thickness. So front upper hall is four inches thick. All right, hall sides are only three inches thick, but that's actually still thicker than the front of a Sherman tank. Uh, the floor, so underneath the hull, the belly of the tank is an inch and a half thick. Uh, and then the rear deck lower is one inch. Now, looking at the turret thickness, the sides is almost five inches. Um, oh, I'm sure, uh, let me see here. Weight, okay, so here we go. Combat loaded weight, 78 tons. So that's the same weight, actually, as the King Tiger. That is a chonker. So combat weight means the tank has fuel, it has all its onboard equipment, it has all its ammunition on board. Um, so to give you how much does that all, all count, including the crew, uh, it's empty weight with 64 and a half tons. So that just tells you how much ammunition and everything else it carries. That, that's actually a lot of stuff. Um, it's ground pressure though, very interesting stuff, is only 11.9 pounds per square inch. That's how, actually- How is, that, how is only... that compared to some other ones? Um, Abrams, I want to say it's 12.5 pounds per square inch. Mm. So it actually, because it has wider track, it actually puts less pressure on the ground than the Abrams tank. Interesting. Um, 
And I think to put that in perspective, and I could be completely wrong because I'm just thinking at the top of my head, I think the human foot is approximately 2.5 to 11 pounds per square inch. Hmm. So this actually, the tank actually puts almost as much uh, weight on the ground as, you know, human foot will not weight pressure on the ground as a human foot does. Hmm. Uh, but that's why tanks, that's, that's the whole concept of tracks because that's what we call flotation, which means that heavy vehicle can cross muddy loose ground without sinking in that's that's the whole whole concept i feel like the little kid from jerry Maguire. you know the average human foot puts so much pressure on the ground um and that was 28 inch track so rt29 there believe it or not there was two sizes of a track what does that sound like um so it actually had 20 inch track and then it had 29 or a 39 inch track with extended end connectors and that only puts 9.5 pounds per square inch. So that tank's not sinking wow except in water, then it's gonna go straight to the bottom. So, ooh, here's a big one. 750 gross horsepower. So that's that's it, that's all you got pushing this. That's actually not very much. So your your power to weight ratio is 11 horsepower per ton. Uh, that's not very good. Okay, so he, average human, it's, so, okay, so someone just said, uh, I'm guessing that's probably from online, that the human foot exerts 16 pounds per square inch. So. That, that's actually really good. So this is putting less pressure than you stay on the ground. And the, word, the, the funny thing is, as soon as you lift up one foot, your pounds per square inch doubles. So that just tells you how effective these tanks are. So lots, lots of goodies in here. So now this tells us how much oil, how much transmission fluid, how much fuel each of the fuel tanks uses. All right. What's the, uh, uh, Matt, what's, uh, what's the uh, fuel efficiency of this vehicle? Um, let <laughs> me look here. Okay, so here we go. Performance. All right, this is, this is me being the, the car salesman. All right, this here tank, all right, it's got a maximum speed at low speed range at eight miles per hour. But uh, okay, this is actually, this is what catches me. Away. How fast do you think this tank can go at high speed? 22 miles per hour. That may not seem very fast, but if you've ever seen a 78 ton tank move at 22 miles per hour, it's actually kind of scary uh, because that's, that's pretty much an unstoppable force. Um, so that's not bad. And it could reverse in eight miles per hour. I don't think T29 ever planned to to retreat, though. I would really like to see the T29 moving backwards at eight miles an hour. That's terrible. It's got to be like a moonwalk. <laughs> yeah, it just that's... looks cool. You know, it looks cool. It's too cool to, to go fast. And it's interesting uh, that it has, um, it shows the limitations with regard to the kind of road and the speed as well. Because when you see, when you it read does. on a stat sheet, it can be... If you if uh, if you only see one like for example if you go to Wikipedia to read about a tank it gives you like one speed and in your head you're gonna think that that tank can go that speed but there's a lot yeah. of extra things to it and I think that it's it's uh, it's nice to see in the specs uh, the the testing results from the different kind of road because that's really gonna vary and you I mean you see that in um, really easily with World War Two with the forces moving forward on different kinds of ground that's available how well can your mm -hmm. tank handle that and how can you how can you think with a reduced speed when the terrain isn't like flawless you know like high school track and field exactly you know? <laughs> and even then that 22 miles per hour it even says here that's short periods on hard road you're, mm. you're only doing that for essentially a, a tactical sprint uh you're, you're not cruising for two hours of that speed because you're probably going to kill the engine now it's miles without refueling so let's let's oh we're gonna have to do some math here i'm sorry okay so all together Left fuel tank is 150 gallons, plus a 50 gallon bustle fuel tank, so that's 200, plus 90, so 295 gallons worth of fuel. Okay. Uh, cross country range is 100 miles. So, so we're not talking miles to gallons, we are talking approximately 2.95, so just under three gallons per mile. Nice. So uh, this Somewhere. is not necessarily. Yeah, this isn't a, a, a environmental friendly tank. This is, uh, it, it failed its uh, admissions testing. Greta is shivering somewhere. Yes, uh. sorry Greta. <laughs> oh, gosh. But I mean, that's, um, somewhat, that's somewhat reasonable for a tank though, isn't it? Um, yeah, generally they really, at least ours haven't gotten much better now. Uh, jet turbine does take quite a lot. Uh, I couldn't tell you unfortunately what, you know, some of the other tanks like a Leo 2, what it's fuel. So I don't know if, any, if anyone here is a, a Leo two uh, crewman that knows what your your fuel mileage is, but um, it's that's that's it's that's a thirsty tank. That's a mm. very very thirsty tank. Um, it can go up a sixty percent grade though, which is pretty impressive for a seventy eight ton tank. What's what would be like what when you say it's impressive uh, for scale? That's, what could we compare it to? 
Ooh, that's, I mean, it's just a very, very steep ramp. I mean, that's like going up like the kind of hillside that, um, you know, you would normally, if you have a low uh, sedan that you'd be like scraping the front, you know, awkwardly going, you know, as you're trying to go up the hill in your, in your, in your small, short little car. And it's interesting, uh, you can ascend and descend the same grade. Yes, so it's the same. So um, I don't know if I would want to take a tank down that, that steep, that this heavy down that kind of a steep, uh, uh, slope but i guess it works is that is that one of the metrics that would vary based off what you're traveling on in a tank oh gosh yes so case in point um i've taken tanks up and down hills before um down fort hood texas there actually were was one particularly steep hill where if you were in an abrams loaded up you would actually have to get a running start uh to get up it effectively um so at least you were at speed uh going up the hill uh, but, but then if it's a dirt road point, or a gravel or scree or something, yep, it would yep. obviously... And it, and it was dirt. Uh, but then on the other side, when I was at Fort Knox, winter of 2009, this is where I start feeling old, um, we got we were in the field for one of my scout courses. An ice storm hit. We were still in the field. They told us to go back in. And as we were on our way back, if there's any Fort Knox vets here, if you know what heartbreak, uh, agony, or misery hills are, um, we started going down one of them. And I watched as a Bradley, and thankfully we let the Bradley go first. Uh, they hit their brakes towards the top of the hill, and the and the 35-ton Bradley just slid like a horse sleigh just all the way down to the bottom of the hill. Oh, no. Um, so, yes, yeah, so that, of course, will depend on on what terrain. Uh, you know, is it is it muddy dirt? Is it is it paved road? Uh, is it grass? So, uh, yeah. So a lot, a lot of different variations. And then um, if you're curious, it's there's 101 blocks of track section per track. So what do they mean by the track pitch? What is that? Six uh, track, track pitch, pitch is the distance, if I remember correctly, the track pitch is the distance between the middle of one track block to another track block. Gotcha. Okay. And I may have that wrong. Ed can correct me because I know me and Ed have discussed this before in the past. That was like two years ago. We were talking about track pitch. Um, I believe that's what that term is. Um, and that just kind of tells you how the how well the track articulates, how how um, I guess articulated it is, because you have some track pitch that's very wide, so it has nice big wide track blocks. But that you know, kind of like a T thirty four, you know, on the on the T thirty four, the track is very angular going around. Um, but then you look at like a Sherman tank, and the track is very smooth going around the sprockets. That that's kind of where track pitch comes into play. Gotcha. I, I may not be a hundred percent on that since uh, I don't have reference on me, but that's, that's if I remember correctly, that's track pitch. And then this tells you your total ground contact is 5,600 inches, well, 5,684 square inches. So that's how much contact the tank actually makes with the ground. That's pretty incredible. If you think about the area of your car tires and how much of those actually touch the ground, um, that's an extremely small area that you're putting pressure on you. Hmm. So... So that's just, that just kind of gives you appreciation for how much of the tank really sits. When when the tank, what it means is when the T29 sits around, it sits around. Sorry, <laughs> I, I'm so sorry. Couldn't help it. Couldn't Could help not it. help it. Could not help it. <sighs> so here's our next section. And so this is going to go into... And yeah, so this is where it gets into the fine uh, nitty gritty of, you know, talking about the engine. So it's a Ford... Uh, oh, Ed, if Ed's still on, this is where you get interested. So it, the basic engine was based off of the same engine as the Sherman, a Ford GAA, uh, but it's a modified version. So this is a Ford model GAC, GAC. So it's changed, but still the same V12, 12-cylinder um, uh, liquid-cooled gasoline engine, um, but it's been modified to produce a little bit more power. Gotcha. Uh, this, is, transmission. this part is always cool because it shows, like it gives you like how to start it up. Like how yes. to get yeah how to get the engine going and like uh, yes and steering fact, it. this is all super detailed um, not just the components but operations instructions and descriptions as well like these these particular volumes that you have have that really fascinating detail of how to actually operate them it's almost like there's like a driver's manual in here of those oh yes actually. Um, I don't know how, oh, oh, Slowpoke, that's your name. He's correct, actually. The original Ford V8 was, or, yeah, Ford engine was a V8. So that also tells you they expanded this out by uh, four cylinders, which is actually closer to the original GA design. Uh, Henry Ford originally uh, had the engine design 
uh, as an aircraft engine, which if you've ever seen a GAA is incredible, you would think, because it's really big. Um, so yes, actually, very good point. Very good point. Thank you for catching that. Because this is the problem. When you read all this stuff, it all starts. So my mind right now, it's kind of like something out of, um, what was that Russell Crowe movie, A Beautiful Mind? Mm -hmm. Like I look at it and like the words start flowing out and it's just numbers all around. And it gets really hard to sometimes keep things straight. Uh, I actually joke that I usually try to only look at one Honeycut notebook at a time because if I try to look at it more, I actually start getting a headache because it's so much information. Hmm. There's a lot, yeah, oh. it's, it's, a, it's a lot of text and explanation, but there are some photographs in these as well, aren't there? And some yep. diagrams that are very, very helpful. Yep. All right, so let's oh. continue, we'll continue with a little bit of the technical components and... Um, yeah, so here it talks about the torsion bar suspension, which at the time was still relatively new. Um, so if you're familiar with how the Sherman looks, that's a vertical or a horizontal volute spring suspension system or vertical volute spring, use both types. So um, that means that it uses large springs mounted over top the road wheels to provide that suspension system. What it's saying at the T29 is it's torsion bar. So the way a torsion bar works is you have your tank hull and there's schematics in the back. So I'll show you that. Um, and the road wheels of the tank are actually mounted onto these torsion bars. And the torsion bars are very, very um, high tensile, really strong bars of steel. And the whole point is that as the road wheel is moved, it's actually twisting that steel bar. And that's where your suspension system, that's your suspension system is literally twisting steel. Hmm. So that gives you appreciation of just how um, powerful torsion bars. And that's why we, we switched to it because uh, Christie volute spring suspension systems, horizontal vertical volute spring suspension systems, uh, they, they just kind of, you know, we, we were maxing out the weight. And so you start seeing that the M18 Hellcat uh, gun motor carriage or tank destroyer. And then of course the M26 Pershing, we go to a torsion bar suspension system. And even now our torsion bar suspension systems are actually um, assisted uh, with kind of partial hydraulic spring components to kind of, you know, help them out. So, so very interesting fact on that. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to take a quick break to get a glass of water, feed this dang dog that won't leave me alone. It'll only take about 30 seconds. Yeah, go and for then, it, that's uh, fine. Because I can't, unfortunately, because I'm working for archives. So curator mm -hmm. pro tip, uh, I never allow any food or water around the archives because that's actually an industry standard. Got to protect the documents. Absolutely. Um, so I will mark the place and I will be right back. <laughs> yes, you're getting fed. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, take a break and wash the hands and feed the dog sure. and whatever we got to do. That is totally fine. So here is your beautiful away screen. Ooh. All right. Can you hear me again? Yeah, you're fine. Okay. Th thankfully for us, the, the wife has come to the rescue. Dogs are going to be fed. Everyone will be happy. Oh, awesome. The writing okay. will cease. Good. Anyway, so we'll so we'll continue. We'll continue with. Uh, so the last thing we left off of was talking a little bit about the suspension and the the, the, the properties yes. of a torsion bar design for a tank. Yes. So where does it say here? Um, we're, wheels are bolted in pairs, outer bearings. Um, okay, so here we go. Here's, here's kind of a, let me get us back here. So uh, torsion bars support the weight of the vehicle and also through Tor tor I'm going to say this wrong, torsional resistance or twisting, if you will, action of the bar caused by the up and down movement of the vehicle. Volute type bumper springs are provided for all road wheel arms. These bumper springs stop the travel of the road wheel arms should the track and wheels wheel. strike an obstacle of sufficient size to overcome the torsional resistance of the bar springs and control the shock absorbers. So what that means is as the wheel rotates up, it has something there to, to stop it. Um, and in fact, Charging I'm now battery. going to take the time to actually go see if we Charging can battery. Let's see schematic 20. Because some of you have probably been sitting here as good little little troopers. So, okay, so here's our schematic of the fuel systems. All right, so, yes. So here are some of your road wheel assemblies. So this is kind of how your road wheels are mounted up. And here you can see, so this is the outside of your torsion bar. So your road wheel and your road arm would be connected to it. And that goes all the way through to the other side of the vehicle. Um, so it's fairly massive. Uh, as you can see, lots of different components uh, that go into it. 
Here's could how you turn that, Could you turn that one sideways for us so we can see? I can indeed. Yeah, thank you. There we go. Thank you for asking. So this is your, your schematic, if you will, of your road wheel. And this is actually looking actually opposite. So this is looking down this way. So that tells you all the things that go into mounting shock absorber brackets, adjusting nuts. Uh, if you have steel, because this, of course, with your hub, because it's such a heavy vehicle, it exerts a lot of friction on the vehicle and the vehicle hubs. So you actually have uh, lubricants in here. So the, ro the road wheel goes around very smoothly. I'm trying to see if there's actually a picture showing the layout of the torsion bars inside the vehicle. Uh, but I feel like I'm giving away too much of the goodness already. Hmm, that's okay. It's a lot of goodness. There's a lot of goodness to give. Oh my from goodness, this it is. So, yeah, so, okay. So, there is the 12 cylinder. As was pointed out, it's a 12 cylinder engine. And it includes so the transmission. It. So, is this the power pack together then? Yes. So, this is the best. So this is, thank you. So this is what I mean. I just realized I'm looking at the camera saying thank you. And I'm like, no one can see me. Um, so this is your power pack. So of course you have your V12 engine here and then it connected right to it is the transmission. So this would be towards the front of the vehicle and this would actually be mounted to the rear of the vehicle. Uh, and then these here on your transmission, these connect to your final drives and that's what drives your uh, differentials and your drive sprockets. And that's what makes the tank go, simple, to, to put it simply. Oops. So this talks about engine performance. A lot of smart people thought of this, and unfortunately, I am not one of them. Uh, I'm sure if I sat here long enough. So this, okay, so this is all about uh, horsepower, or gross horsepower versus net horsepower. Oh, here we go. Beautiful, beautiful layout uh, showing the bottom of the tank. So this is your hull top cross section. So this is looking inside the T29 X-ray vision. Um, so of course you have your track layout here. And so this is the 39 inch or 39? Yeah, 39 inch track. So it has extended end connectors or duck bills as you often hear them called. Up here you have your driver's seat. You have your assistant driver that they were called at the time. You often in World War II hear they call it a bog. Um, Behind them, you can see here are ammunition lockers. So some of your ammunition is going to be kept below the turret. All right, and then back here, you can just see how much of uh, the uh, engine and fuel tanks took up of the vehicle. So these are actually two of the fuel tanks. As you can see, uh, they're rounded in the front because right here is where the turret sits. Cool. This is all. This so that would be all underneath the floor for the crew. So that's not uh, something. Some of it would be. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, like, like, like the series with the, with the diagram, it like, it's like, okay, the fuel tanks are here, and it's kind of hard to see if that would be something that you could see as a crew member, or if that's enclosed in the vehicle underneath the floor that you'd be walking on as a crew well, member. Uh, it would actually probably, so if you're like the gunner sitting here, it would actually be behind you, but there's going to there's be a little bit of a, a protective skirting okay. slash firewall element, because obviously you don't want the fuel tanks, you know, completely right beside you. Right, gotcha, okay. Here so we it's go. hard to see. There, like, oh, there we go. There we go. There we go. Okay. Oh, oh, yes. So this is yeah. So this is real big. So this is looking, of course, sideways into the T29. Uh, very similarly laid out to the M26 Pershing, because of course it's like a Pershing on steroids initially, as far as the design. But there's some unique differences. Um, gun, of course, was not this long, so that's that's not like some sort of special, you know, derp gun. Yeah. Uh, don't don't get an idea. Certain certain video game producers. Um, but this is just you know cut away the gun. Um, so yes, yeah, so you'd have your driver and your assistant driver down here. You can see what looks like fire extinguishers behind them. Uh, coming up here to the turret, turret basket. So yes, you'd have ammunition lockers on the floor, uh, fuel tanks, oil reservoirs back here. Here's your engine, your transmission. And again, uh, final drives differentials into your drive sprockets back here. Um, the biggest difference with the turret is because the 105 millimeter gun now you might be familiar with the fact that our M60 tank and our early M1s uh, have 105 millimeter guns. This is not your your father's 105 millimeter gun. This is your your grandfather's 105. So it's a two piece ammunition. Uh, so you have you know first guy he's laying big big hefty 105 millimeter armor piercing uh, round, rams it in, and then the next guy follows up with the cartridge casing behind two piece ammunition. So it, earlier um, in the it, earlier in the manual, it mentioned that there were six crews. So does it have two loaders to handle the two part ammunition in this tank? 
It does indeed. And so in order to give them room to do their job behind the gun, the tank commander, now traditionally what you see on American tanks is that the tank commander kind of sits almost beside the gun on the right side of the turret. On this, and you actually see they do have uh, dashed lines, the tank commander actually sits directly behind the gun breech uh, in the bustle of the turret, hmm. like a ship captain. You get to sit in the back and look down upon all all you survey. Uh, and so you actually, it's, it's it, we like to call them uh, captain's chairs, you know, like Star Trek. And you get to sit back there and kind of, you know, tell 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 your crew to, to uh, start deleting things. Um, that's a very, very... Uh, it's kind of cool just to sit back there and actually be seeing everything happen. But at the same time, it would also terrify me as a tank commander because if the gun for some reason would go off out of battery, it's now going directly into the seat of your pants. Oof. Yep. Yes. Is that a common... When I say common, is that noted to occur often enough that a tank commander should have that in his head? Like, is that... A, like, when, I, like when, I, when you say a common occurrence or a common um, problem or it's, something, you know what I mean? A common... It's not common but it happens gotcha. which is usually so the first thing you and that the reason why it happens is because the gun is not mounted properly or its recoil system's not working which causes it to uh you know eventually break its mountings um and that's coming out of battery but that's why anytime any sort of major maintenance is done on the on, on the on the gun mount you usually then are supposed to test fire the gun and when you test fire it you're using a um um, oh shoot, I can't remember the term for it now. But you're not in the tank when you fire it. You connect gotcha. the fire controls essentially to, to, to a controller. You get out behind the tank, fire, check the tank, make sure the gun hasn't unmounted itself. And so there, there's checks for that. Can it happen? Yes. Um, it's one of those things where it only happens in like once in a hundred blue moons. But gotcha. if it does happen, it's bad. It's very bad. It's 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 very, very, very bad. That's That's a three very, very bad situation gotcha. yeah that's like oh that sounds like an absolute an incredible nightmare but had to how you know so it's not going to be in the back of your head is like oh god this could this could happen today but it is something that can fail that system can yes. fail and so the commander but at that point would it, be it, it, would, it would be a catastrophic failure i mean look, gotcha. it, it would multiple things would have had to have been done wrong and honestly the most dangerous time would be after the gun's been removed for any sort of work or rebarreling um and that really doesn't happen that much gotcha okay good that's good to know all right cool yep so we look down. Oh, there's a nice, beautiful top-down shot. You gotta have your shovel. That's gotta right. have your shovel. It's not a tank <laughs> if it doesn't have a shovel. That's American. American tanks, shovels. Russians can have their logs. Shovels. I like that it's included all the places for any tools on the outside on the diagrams as well. Indeed. Got that so oh, look at that. Visible too. Yeah, there we so go. That's your majestic beast in the in the sun there. Um, what's interesting is they don't have the muzzle brake attached yet. And actually, if I can go back here. Because it has the muzzle brake in all the diagrams. Um. Yes, and, and it was fitted for it. Um, so if you're not familiar, if you ever look at pictures and you see this big, you know, fancy looking baffled item, that's a muzzle brake. Um, this, just try and explain what a muzzle brake is. So as tank guns get more powerful in World War II, you know, of course, when you fire a gun, you have not only do you have the round going this way, but now the recoil of the gun moving backwards. And as the guns get more powerful, that recoil is getting more powerful. So you have to have systems capable of taking that recoil, recoil system. Um, World War II is mostly spring systems, and then we start getting the hydraulic systems, and that's what we use today. Uh, but the problem is back then, since the technology still was kind of in its infancy, infancy um, the problem is if the bigger you made the recoil system, the bigger the turret had to be. So case in point, when you see the pictures of the Super Sherman, uh, the M26A4, I believe, someone can fact check me on that. Um, you'll actually see it has recoil system, at least the one that went to Europe, the recoil system's actually mounted on top of the turret hmm. because it just couldn't fit it in. Um, so one way to help that out is you put a muzzle brake on. And the best way to explain how a muzzle brake works is you have to look at here. In fact, if you see, I'm waiting for my camera to, to catch up, but you can see the muzzle brake here on the front. You'll notice it has these baffles and it's flanged out. So what happens is as the round goes down the barrel, of course, the gases are coming behind it. And of course, gas, what does it do? It wants to expand to fill, uh, uh, you know, any open space. Um, 
And so what happens is as the gas comes out, of course, it wants to come out the sides here. You know, round goes this way and the gas immediately wants to come out the side. And as the gas comes out, you have to think of these flanges on the baffles as almost like sails. That's actually how the German manuals describe it. It works like a sail. So the gas comes out, the baffles catch the gas. And so what that does is as the gun starts to recoil back, those gases coming out the side slow the gun down. And in the case of the Tiger One's muzzle brake, it actually, uh, the manual, the Tiger, Tiger Field Bull says that uh, it reduced the recoil by 70%. Whoa. So that's, a, so, and the point is then if your tank's designed with a muzzle brake, you don't want to fire it without a uh, muzzle brake. Because it's not, it wouldn't be designed to, to receive that force. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Gotcha. So in that, in that, uh, in that photo when it's missing its muzzle brake, under no circumstances are you going to ever allow that to occur in the field. You're going to have a muzzle brake on your vehicle before you are operating it well, at all. But this is just for gosh, testing if, stuff. If you're this on a vehicle, is... now there have been some vehicles in the past where the muzzle brakes, so like the Sherman tanks, um, you know, World War II, some of them had muzzle brakes towards the end and they would have been calibrated for that, but they probably could have gone a little bit without it. Mm. Uh, most modern vehicles that are designed muzzle brakes, no, you do not want to fire them without a muzzle brake. That'd be, that would be very bad because at that point then your recoil system is going to be taxed so hard. Uh, that's when you're going to risk a gun coming out of battery, possibly. Gotcha. gotcha. So, and then it's like an important, as you mentioned earlier, T stands for tests. And this was just, that photo is of a, a built prototype, but it never was put into service. And if you did see it in service, it would have the muzzle brake on is kind of the, the larger point. Yep. Gotcha. Yep. Yes. So those are muzzle brakes in very, very easy layman terms. Cool. Oh, that's the good stuff. The center. Oh, folds. there you go, Sophie. There yeah. you go. We all know what Sophie <laughs> likes. There we go. Yep. So huge mufflers, huge mufflers. That's definitely a telltale sign when you're looking at the T29 series. That's right. They're flat on the T30. They've been flattened. They're not round like yep. that in storage. Oh, so here you can see when it was described earlier, I was talking about how the how the turret has a heavy bustle. Um, bustle actually, as far as ordnance, that comes actually from battleship turrets. Uh, once again, showing naval terms given to us by the Royal Navy uh, when they helped fund the original tank prototypes. Uh, but that's what's showing is a lot of this back here is simply here as weight balance for the gun. So if you don't have as as a as a comparison, so like for if you. If the rear of your turret doesn't have that counterweight, you're gonna run into issues with the weight of the gun because of its dude. It's just uh, so length obviously has something to do with it as well. Yes. Like and it's gonna uh, it's gonna fuck up how you turn the turret as well, does it not? Or uh, if yes. Uh, so I'm trying to see if I can find a good picture of it. Um, so yeah, this is a good one. Yeah. So the problem, the reason why turrets have to be balanced, and this is another thing that comes about in tank design, especially when we talk about upgrading tanks with bigger guns. Um, first of all, the diameter of your turret ring is important because if your turret ring is too small, your gun can't elevate uh, or um, depress effectively enough. And But another issue is the balance of the turret. So if we didn't have the back of this turret and most of the weight of the gun was up here in the front, that means that even though you probably wouldn't see it, the turret's going to lean forward in the turret ring. And what that means is with more pressure on the turret ring, the turret's not going to move, rotate as well. It's going it's to, there's too much potential for jamming up. And another problem is that will then eventually wear out your turret ring. Because hmm. that's something that actually has to get checked on tanks is to make sure turret rings aren't getting worn out. Turret rings are actually made with essentially almost like a liner, like a you know layer that goes around a skate ring that the turret can move smoothly on. Every once in a while that has to get replaced. And so... If your turret's not well balanced, it's also going to affect because you're assuming that you're going to shoot the tank on totally level ground. But if your ground yes. isn't level either and your turret's not well balanced, you're going to get some problems um, as you move the gun about. It probably it won't much. affect that, but the second you go to rotate the turret, it's going to cause it's going to cause issues. Gotcha. So it's yeah, so it'll affect so it'll affect turret rotation um, mm -hmm. if you don't have that. So it's it's interesting to see how big that the this is sounds really dirty but how big the bustle is on the t29 mm -hmm. and, and it's uh sort of the sisters in its series yes um, yep. and once again it's it's all there to counter this oh let's see if we have any other good images here because we have plenty of other uh, blame me i got plenty of other materials so are there any photos on this one of it in action during testing so the <sighs> not in this one i do have other photos of it being tested and slew of boxes i'm looking at across the room here okay because i've seen I've, you see some of those in hanukkah's work um yes. i was wondering if this is the volume that they do come from or not but if not 
Maybe no, so this is just the technical notes. So like I said, this is closer to being like the operator's manual. Oh, ooh, 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 this is good. This is good. This is good stuff. So I want to see if I have to. So let's let's look inside the T29 as it would have looked like to the crew. Cool. Get in your way back machine, boys and girls, with me. We're going on a journey. Instead of the magic school bus, what would it be? The magic would it tank, be? obviously. Well, what tank would it be? Oh, no, that's a whole discussion. Nominations. We do another We're taking video. nominations. What would the magic tank be? Our time traveling vehicle. <laughs> If I get to be Miss Frizzle, that would... Well, I guess if it has to be like a school bus, would it be like the Magic 113? You know, because you got to be able to put lots of oh people Oh my god, you're able... right. Yep. <laughs> so, if you're the driver, this is your driver's station. Uh, as you can see, very conveniently, the driver at his feet has an escape hatch, so he can get out. Uh, it's kind of interesting because if you look at the T29, it has like a very boat-shaped front on it on the bottom. Uh, you know, it curves. It's almost like a V-haul. Mm. Uh, part of that is because that helps protect from upward blasts, but I also know part of that is because that gives the escape hatches an angle. Uh, if you're familiar with Clarence Smoyer, the M26 gunner, yes. um, one of the things he told me, and this is very interesting, one of the things he told me is, so there's also an escape hatch for the driver in the M26 Pershing, very similar location, but it's flat. And because it's very flat on the bottom and the person has a very flat bottom tall that's kind of low, he found out one time that when he was trying to get out of his tank in a fight, um, that they were on a very muddy road, so the tank had kind of sunk in. So when he went to drop his escape hatch to get out of the tank, the hatch only fell about three inches and stopped. Whoa. And he couldn't get out of the tank. Uh, what's really funny is he actually reported that complaint to the ordnance team that was evaluating the M26, and we actually have those notes in our archives. And I actually showed him his complaint you know, 75 years later. Uh, oh when he goodness. came and visited us. So that, so that, that was kind of cool. So that's just a point. So here, though, you can see they've angled the escape hatch uh, with the hull, so now there's going to be more space to get out. Uh, there's your foot brake lever, you got throttles, accelerator, your driver's manual steering levers. So if you ever uh, have used like an older type forklift, uh, not forklift, uh, skid loader, skid steer, it's going to be a very similar concept to you uh, in that respect. A little, little more complicated, but that's the, the basic way of uh, explaining it. Of course, you have your transmission, and then you have your instrument panel, which this is a fairly advanced instrument panel compared to the what they had in... Um, World War II. They were already, you know, this is all still at the end of the war, but they're already expanding out. There's more controls. Plus, they've put it in the center so that the assistant driver can actually see it. And then you can see all your conduit cable, everything else going up uh, in the center of the upper hall, the, the top of the hall. That's such a cool view. What are some of the other internal uh, photos here? There we go. So here's the co driver station. So this is what you call the bow gunner, but he's also like the co driver assistant driver. So you see from his view, he has his own set of controls. So if you're the driver, uh, let's say you're doing a long road march, or for some reason he gets injured, co-driver can take over. Uh, but he also then has a 30 caliber uh, this is an M1919 A4 machine gun, uh, so he can engage, much like you would have saw in a certain movie with Brad Pitt. Uh, okay, so here we are looking down actually at the levers, so you can see all the bits underneath their seats. Hmm. Uh, do not want to lose your wallet down there. All right, so here is the commander's cupola. So this is looking at the top of the turret. So you got hatch actually for both loaders uh, and the gunner. And then, of course, commander's cupola in the center. This is a, an all-around vision cupola that was introduced. Um, I don't know which American tank would have been the first to introduce it, but it, of course, gets mounted on the uh, M4A3 tanks later in the war. But what's really interesting is, so this hatch, using a World War II, this hatch is still in the Army system today on the M88 tank recovery vehicle. So that's why we never worry about people ask us. Sometimes they'll find these hatches and ask us if we want them. And generally we're okay because the army still has this in their supply chain. Gotcha. Okay. Including the vision ports and everything else. So that's kind of cool. All right. So here, here's the real good stuff. So this is, if we were sitting on the gun breach, this is what you would see looking back to the back of the turret. So you can see on either side. <laughs> okay. So not only is the tank commander... <laughs> Sitting behind the gun breach, so the, the gun breach is literally coming back and forth as it's firing. On either side of you is the ammunition. Uh, you know, much like a throne of death, you are you are you are sitting on all all the all the ammunition all around you. Uh, wow. So that's kind of cool. That's 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 that's. I don't know how I'd feel about that. <laughs> I, I try to. I'm sitting here and I'm imagining sitting uh, sitting in that seat and the gun breach coming back every time. I think it would take like a little bit to get used to that. Um, that speed oh, yeah. and that force coming directly at you, like, every time would be 
like really jarring at the like the first mm-hmm. several times it happens. I'm sure that you know these folks get used to being around uh, all this mass in motion and crazy, uh, absolutely hearing destroying uh, levels of sound. And I, I'm sure you get used to it. People can get used to the craziest things, but it mm-hmm. would be so jarring to see that breach move back towards you directly oh. like that. And someone actually kind of said something to what I was going to say is, you know, I looked at it and all I could think is I, I'd have to send in it like William Shatner, you know, enhance, enhance. <laughs> Probably has more firepower than the Enterprise, though. Yeah, that's a lot. And remember, it's two-piece ammunition, so your, your powder charges would be in these bottom racks here, and then your uh, shells would be on the top. Got to. I think so. All right, and then behind the commander's seat... Well, actually, okay. Ah, okay, so this is interesting. So you can't see the whole picture. i got to be very careful here. So tucked in, so you have the crash pads here, and then tucked in behind the crash pads, closer back to where the commander sits, there's the radios. So those are your standard SDRs, same type used in World War II. Got your radio terminal control box. And then behind the commander, that's where he would have onboard equipment. So if uh, they're carrying a submachine gun sword, that's where his ammunition go. His map cases, signal flags, they'd all go there as well. Oh, what have they got here? Hold on here, hold on here. All right, so there's another radio. Um, so, oh, so you hear about crew ventilation. Uh, so there's your, your what they call the blower. So that would be there to be uh, pulling out uh, fumes from the tank. And there's that is like a tiny little home back there. That's quite cool to see. Okay, so then this is kind of looking more from the tank commander's view. Um, so, all right. So here's your gun breach, all nice and shiny. So you got one loader, so the loaders get seats. As you can see, there's racks around the turret ring for 50 caliber machine gun boxes. Um, ready racks for 105. All right, so here you can see uh, the coaxial machine, uh, 50 caliber machine guns. Um, so you can see they're sitting there beside the, the gun, and then you would actually have your feed tray up there. That's interesting. That's completely, wow, that's a lot different than I would have expected um, going from that direction. That's the nice thing about the Browning machine guns is that they're reversible depending on what you're using them for. Wait, so what, is, then, what is that? What is that? What is that? Uh, so normally, most U.S. machine guns, most, most, and they're, they're, even today, uh, especially on like the Bradley 240, yeah, uh, most of them are what we call left-hand feed. So the rounds, ammunition's located over here, and the rounds feed this way. Uh, the way this is set up, your ammunition is actually feeding from right to left. But the Browning machine gun designs, like the 1919 and the M2, the Maw Deuce, you, you can reverse them. They're made to reverse that way, which is another reason why they're so popular. Okay. Yep. Let me see here. It's so cool to be able to see inside this tank with these photos. Yeah, I mean, I've honestly never even tried getting in ours. A lot of ours were welded up and everything. And at some point we do plan on getting them because they're going to need some work in there. Uh, so this is just really nice seeing what it would have looked like. Uh, so this is, this is the real office of my pants. So this is the gunner seat. So he has his direct sight telescope up there. But you'd also have periscope up here, uh, 50 caliber machine gun firing button. Let's see, traversing handles, how he controls it, azimuth indicator. So azimuth indicator allows the gunner, uh, that tells him which way the gun is facing compared to the rest of the tank, as well as uh, north or south, or, or um, I'm sorry, yeah, with the rest of the tank. Um, more ready racks for ammunition. Did I mention there's a lot of ammunition on board? It's. It seems so. It seems yes, so. it's it's a good value. It you know may not have good mileage, but it has lots of bang for the buck. Gotcha. All right, and so here's showing the components. Uh, so here you have your gearbox. So this is actually what helps drive the turret. Here's your traversing mechanisms. Okay, so if you need to ever do the wiring of a T29, this is what t- this tells you how it all works, wow. how it's all connected. That's cool. Yeah, that's something that like that's something that's <laughs> would be really hard to come across, oh, and it's, gosh, that's yes. an amazing diagram. So a little hey, bit of, was that I wanted to show some clarity for chat that this vehicle and sure. its variant, the T twenty nine E three, are both actually at Rob Kogan's collection. Yes. At Fort Benning, so actually, so. I have T twenty nine and T twenty nine E three. So uh, both both those vehicles. They this, do exist. Is, they were the, yes. the, the photos of they the prototype. Exist. They're still around. So this these tanks were really built, even though they weren't put into service. They're really built, and they do still exist. And the real ones are in Rob Kogan's collection. I've done walk arounds yes. of the T twenty nine E three. We haven't done like any commentary video on it yet, but they definitely do exist. I do the walk around silent, just kind of like for modelers if they want details or for people to actually see that the tank is real. Um, 
but these tanks were absolutely actually built. So this is uh, this is accompanying a tank that is still around. Just to clarify for the chat. Yep. And here then you can see uh, wiring diagrams from another point of view. So this is from the top. Uh, so it shows you how the wiring was designed to go around the turret. Hmm. Uh, so I always like to you know around the turret. That's almost like watching like that's like the you know cardiovascular system of a tank as far as how everything that feeds the tank goes either around the turret or connects here to the turret slip ring. Which this right here is probably one of the most important parts of tank design, uh, just because so especially on modern tanks with digital systems, you know, that's where your information is flowing through to the rest of the tank. And to make that work while allowing the turret to still traverse through at sixty degrees, that is that is like like holy levels of engineering. Hmm. Yes, I, I had to do like my, you know, praise, Italian praise there. <laughs> and I'm not even Italian, I'm Irish, American. All righty. Ooh, ooh, we have a fold out here. Oh. Feel, feel, whoa, gosh. Oh. Okay, so take that wiring diagram and now explode it out where an electrician could actually understand it. Wow, look at that. And this is where, uh, this is, so I was telling you about how sometimes I get headaches if I look through too much of this stuff. This is where I start getting like the, the fifth element, like the random like drop of blood come out of my nose, you know, and the shakes. Uh, Cause this is, this is getting to the point where it's like, if I had the resources, I could build my own T29. Hmm. 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 Oh, gotta put this all nice and neatly back. All right, what do we got here? Okay, so this is your electronics now in the turret itself, showing you all the electronics that are coming up. So once again, coming up through the slip ring and designing it in a way that no matter which way the turret turns, the gun goes up and down, that's clear and protected, and it's not going to get ripped out. That's cool. That's cool. It's hard. To, it's like uh, you don't even think about something like the wiring in a tank with the motion, you know, no, necessarily. And, and honestly, that's one of the most dangerous things with modern tanks is if this stuff is not secured. Uh, unfortunately, one time I had um, the displeasure of essentially being given a rental tank on a train exercise that was not my own tank. And what I found out is that the unit that had that tank prior to me, they had done services on it, which you're required to do so often in the army. Um, but it was a tank they weren't using, and so they didn't really put it back together very well. So what happened is, if you will, um, you know, there's screens here on the bottom of the turret, so as the turret rotates, you know, your arms and legs aren't getting caught in the side. And what happened is they put the those uh, basket screens on very loose, and one of them decided to come unattached while we were on a road march, scanning, you know, turrets moving around left and right. And so what happened is that screen came out and as the turret rotated it crushed and it just ripped out a whole bunch of the hydraulic cables oh my god killed killed, killed the tank immediately wow. um and you know initially i was mad because it looked bad on my tank crew but then when the mechanics got on board they found that half the tank wasn't properly put together it was literally it had been put back together so loose things were coming apart that should have been so they told me that we were probably lucky that's all that happened wow um and yeah, so I was not very, very happy with that at all because my tank was perfect. And then they, for this train, I had to use someone else's tank. National Train Center stories. Oof. Love it. The box. All right. Okay, so this is looking back. Uh, so this is looking, I yes, yeah, so this would be uh, on the floor of the turret looking towards the back. So this is where your like hydraulic gauges are, uh, batteries. Uh, so that's how you could check it all conveniently back there. And then showing some of the communications. All right, you can see it. Okay, so here's the gunner's periscope and Rio stats. So the gunner would use this for his initial scanning, and then when he gets ready to engage or you know detailed scanning, he would then switch to his direct vision gun sight. Okay, so this is uh, sometimes here is called pony motor or little Joe. Uh, so this is the auxiliary engine. Uh, today we call this an APU. So the whole point of the auxiliary engine is if you're not running the main engine, uh, you can have this running inside the tank, and that'll keep your radios powered on so they don't die, because if your radios lose power, you have issues uh, with their encryption uh, or cipher. Uh, this keeps the power on your turret and can also help you keep warm in cold weather, even if you're not running your engine because you don't want to waste the gas. Gotcha. I, I like how as soon as I said NTC, I can see people are like, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like, like a dirty word, NTC. Oh, so yeah, there's dogs are engine again. So that's most out of the T29. Okay. Well, uh, 
I say we bump it up, though. Okay, let's bump it up. Let's let's Boys bring it girls, up a notch. Let's bump it up. 